Everyone take their seats so we can begin the session, please. There are Hey Walter, is this on? Hello? I haven't seen him. I hope I hope somebody finds him. Can we ask everyone to please take their seats so we can begin the session? Hello? Would everyone please take their seats so we can begin the session? I really want to thank um, our panelists. Um, I also want to acknowledge some of the people that have arrived. Uh, Defense Minister McKay, we wish you'd been here uh, uh, to uh, talk about. Well, you could. <laughs> A number of other guests have arrived. We really appreciate it. Um, one of our most important partners in pulling off Brussels Forum is the federal authorities of Belgium, the different uh, parts of the government. One of the things we always try to do at every Brussels Forum is do something particularly Belgium. And this year we have um, on display some wonderful pieces of sculpture by Oliver Strabel. Uh, probably the most renowned uh, sculptor here in Belgium. Take a look at them if you get a chance. There's a wonderful book. He also did a very monumental piece uh, at the Olympics, last Olympics in Beijing that has become uh, quite uh, well known. Uh, but we're just very appreciative of that uh, kind of support. It's um, now my pleasure to uh, introduce His Excellency Herman van Rompuy, the Prime Minister of uh, Belgium. Um, he became Prime Minister uh, late in the last year as part of uh, a solution to an ongoing series of issues confronting politics, political life here in Belgium. What is very interesting as you go around this country is um, I guess in the 15 or 20 years that I've been coming here, I've rarely heard a politician almost always described as this is the right guy at the right time. Uh, he's had a very long career in Belgian <coughs> politics. Started at the age of 16. Sounds like child abuse to me, but uh, <laughs> he got started very early, got very involved. He has held a variety of important uh, positions. He was a former uh, vice prime minister, a former minister of the budget, which is certainly uh, an important background uh, for the challenges he faces today. 
He's a Minister of State and Speaker of the House of Representatives until he took over his prime ministerial uh, duties. Prime Minister Van Rompuy, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Brussels Forum this year, and thank you so much for everything Belgium does for us. Please. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I thank everyone who has given me the opportunity to open the fourth session of the Brussels Forum. In ancient Rome, the World Forum meant any public place for meeting or discussion. It was probably difficult to imagine in those days that more than 2,000 years later, the same word would be used for describing a closed meeting in the private hotel to discuss a subject as complex as the subject of transatlantic relations in a city that cannot compete with the architecture of monumental Rome. But I do appreciate that the German Marshall Fund remains committed to Brussels as a venue for organizing the forum. I encourage them to confirm their choice and to further develop their conference into a real partnership event, you can count on the continued support of the Belgian federal government. Ladies and gentlemen, the subject of transatlantic relations has always belonged to the art of logical disputation, or as the German philosophers Fichte and Hegel called it, to the world of dialectics. The relationship implies forces that sometimes attract and sometimes separate. It involves two powers of comparable economic size, exchanging between themselves a very significant part of total world trade, developing important cross-investments and substantial technological links. This could only lead to a strong cooperation in the name of mutual interests. Curiously, for a long time, between the United States and the European Union, there was no cooperation agreement, in contrast to the numerous cooperation agreements that both partners had signed with many other partners in the world. But even after agreements were made to frame the transatlantic cooperation, the relationship remained ambivalent to the extent that both partners compete on the same world trade market, on the technological front, and to the extent that they pursue different social policies. The Lisbon process added to a strive for excellence between the two economies. In times of economic and financial crisis, it would be inappropriate to try to answer the question which partner came out better and which partner will come out better. But one has to admit that the American economy has for a long time been superior in terms of GDP per capita, in terms of labor volumes, in terms of capital risk. The United States figures have been superior to that of the European Union. The constant innovation process supported by a proactive policy in the field of defense, has given the United States a remarkable technological advance. I've always been, I always had the impression that within the liberal market economy of the United States, there was a motor, a motor of convictions and maybe also of planning. But there are also vulnerab vulnerabilities in the American system. In comparison to Europe, Access to education and to health care is less satisfactory. The American model of non-ecological energy consumption is different for the European one, from the European one. And finally, an abnormal internal and external debt situation represents another factor of high vulnerability. The fact that we definitely share a number of values but differ significantly on our socio-economic models has puzzled more than one observer. But I remain strongly convinced that continental Europe will keep its own typical model 
as its guide for economic and social policy. It is basically a long-term policy, stability-oriented, respecting environment, trying to respect environment, and correcting major social failures of the free market. We call it our Rhineland model. It is based on the German-Austrian thinking dating back to the 19th century. It is a different approach from Smith and Ricardo, whose economic thinking is at the basis of the so-called Washington Consensus. The Rhine model includes a Bismarck model of social security with compulsory insurance, a tripartite management, and non-funded. Ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is only but one analysis. It is not even a comprehensive one, neither a subtle or thought-provoking analysis compared to some of the more populist characterizations of the transatlantic relationship. We had our differences and will no doubt have them again. Transatlantic views have differed from the wisdom of using force on questions of legality, on trade and security issues, on the regulation of financial markets. The point is that at a certain moment in time, we must have both realized that cooperation slowed down between the United States on the one hand and a significant number of countries, regional and international organizations on the other hand, or that cooperation may have been stopped. Relations between Europe and the United States were not going in the right direction. The contrast between unilateral and multilateral approaches played a central role. But, but the good news was that even on the most contentious issues, public opinion on both sides of the Atlantic has never been monolithic. There were always shades of opinion. And whatever difficulties there may have existed between allies in the past, it was always, always possible for European leaders to pick up the phone and talk to Washington. Today, many want to look at this relationship with fresh eyes. We all know why. The dramatic events that took place over the previous eight years, from the terrorist attacks of 9-11, right up to the outbreak of the global financial crisis, set the scene for the transition to the Obama administration. Ladies and gentlemen, there is great expectation regarding America's role, particularly in foreign policy, in the coming four or eight years. During his inaugural address on January the 20th, 2009, President Obama declared that all other peoples and governments who are watching today know that we are ready to lead once more. In the 60 days between his, this important speech and today's conference, the President has set his country on a path that is meeting widespread support around the world. He has ordered as soon as possible the closure of Guantanamo Bay detention facilities. He has appointed special envoys for the Middle East peace and for developing an integrated strategy for both Pakistan and Afghanistan. He has offered to make progress with the Muslim world as well as to the extent, extend a hand to authoritarian regimes if they are willing, I quote, unclench their fist. I would also like to highlight the recent series of visits to Brussels by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and by Vice President Joe Biden. Today we welcome here one of the most important congressional delegations since long. These high-level visits tell us something about the new desire to listen, to cooperate, to develop real partnerships, in other words, words to look at the transatlantic relations with fresh eyes. How to make the best use of this opportunity? 
Complex dialectics do not produce automatically new results when the context changes. How to arrive at this new synthesis, synthesis resulting from a fruitful collision of ideas from which a higher truth may, might derive? We could, for example, recommit ourselves on both sides of the Atlantic to a number of simple ideas. First, once we agree on common solutions and objectives, we should all contribute to our achievement. I know that there has been much American criticism of Europe for not doing enough on defense or not doing enough on Afghanistan. Some of that criticism is justified. But security today is also a multidimensional concept. Bringing peace, stability and order in an effective way is no easy job, as we have found out in Afghanistan and as the United States was reminded in Iraq. One has to accept that Europe will never be able to follow a full-fledged security approach in order to realize overall strategic objectives. In the meantime, most governments in Europe have repaired their security relationship with the United States. President Sarkozy has even decided to bring France into NATO's integrated military command, and I do welcome this important step. On Afghanistan, I accept that new efforts are needed. I will try before the NATO summit of April to decide on an additional contribution of civilian military nature on top of the efforts my country is already undertaking. This brings me to a second idea, that we act together to sustain and strengthen the world based on rules. No other choice offers a better way to underpin contributions to common objectives. Some people say that Americans and Europe's approach differ on this. We can discuss that. But if allies want to seize the new opportunity of the day, then the real point becomes to the rediscover together the force of what is called legitimacy and credibility. The more we get back to that route, the more our decisions will become accepted. The greater the acceptance, the better we can explain to our publics the need for common effort and additional contributions. Third, we should identify the real challenges on which we have to cooperate now and achieve common success soon. I see three priority issues, trade, climate, and financial architecture. We face real tests on these three fronts and we face them at short notice. At the G20 in April in London, at Copenhagen in December, and hopefully very soon on the WTO to conclude the Doha Round. Both Europe and the US administration have a key role to play in injecting positive dynamics into those negotiations. It is now that we have to demonstrate that we have learned something from whatever mistakes we may have made in the last 20 or 10 years. We are talking about real tests, not about simulation or academic exercise. Fourth, we have to remain realistic. Why? For different reasons. First, the world has changed. President Obama and his administration have recognized the fact that the world is now one of real interdependence and that the most pressing international issues for climate change to non-nuclear proliferation cannot be solved by nations on their own. But I think that on the three priority issues I have just mentioned, Europe and the United States can make together a huge difference. Second, there are also the realities of domestic politics. Collective responses to global challenges often require compromise on national interests and sovereign government decision-making. Each partner has his own constraints, and I include also the European Union in this remark. Third, 
we still have to exit from the present financial and economic crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned in my opening address some names of European philosophers and economists. That is pure coincidence, except for my personal wish to bring a European voice to the forum. But I could as well have mentioned many other voices, like the voice of John Kennedy when he proposed a partnership with Europe in the form of a declaration of interdependence. I am sure that during the discussion within the 20 or more panels of this weekend's forum, interdependence will become one of the key words I approve in advance and wish all of you good luck. Thank you. to uh, take seats up here. One of the things that makes the Brussels Forum, I think, useful and important is the very strong interest we've had from members of Congress in uh, attending this uh, event. Um, we're very privileged that we have the, uh, that I have the two co-chairs of the delegation which I think is maybe one of the largest delegations that have been brought to Europe in some time. Uh, Senator Robert Casey of Pennsylvania, who's uh, in his first term as a, a senator, uh, chairs the Subcommittee on uh, Middle Eastern Affairs at Senate Foreign Relations, and has really been a very important force in pulling together this year's delegation. He was also the co-chair last year, and we very much appreciate it and Senator Bob Bennett, who many of you know from his um, many visits here to uh, Brussels and his active involvement in TPN. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Senator Casey. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm greatly honored to be here tonight, and I don't know if I can fully express how grateful we are, because last year we tried to get here, but we didn't ever make the trip. <laughs> we got about... Senator Bennett might correct me, but probably about a third of the way before we had uh, mechanical difficulties. I'll spare you the details, but we're really grateful for this opportunity. And I'm especially honored to, uh, tonight to be able to uh, stand before you as the co-chair of this delegation with Senator Bob Bennett, uh, whom I'll introduce in a few moments. We have a delegation, a total delegation of 12, and I'll, I'll um, introduce by name each of, each of the delegation members in a moment. But I wanted to highlight a couple of issues that uh, face all of us, whether uh, we come here from the United States uh, or Europe or anywhere in the world. All of these issues in one way or another uh, confront us. They are but uh, two or three of many, uh, but I wanted to spend just a couple of moments on three. First of all, of course, the urgent economic and financial challenge we have. It's hard in a few words to encapsulate what this means to families in the United States of America and around the world. Suffice it to say that in America, unlike any other time in our history, maybe since the 30s and maybe not even, uh, not, not even then in terms of a short period of time, we've lost millions of jobs in just six months, an unprecedented uh, job loss. Our financial system has been badly damaged to the point where I'm not sure anyone in Washington is quite sure where uh, that will end up. And we've got a lot of work to do on both. And I know I speak uh, in concert with so many people here. Uh, this isn't just limited, as you know, to the United States. It's a worldwide uh, economic recession. Call it what you will, but it is traumatic in the lives of so many families. People losing their jobs, uh, losing their homes in many cases, and because of retirement savings, as well as other losses, uh, really their hopes and their dreams. But even in the midst of that challenge, we have other uh, urgent challenges. I'll just mention two, Afghanistan and Iran. We know what the objective was when uh, the, the military forces went into Afghanistan back 
several years ago. It was to make sure that uh, extremists in that part of the world did not have a sanctuary or a safe haven in Afghanistan. We have to be very clear, however, as we go forward to make sure that we clearly articulate, identify, and then uh, communicate well that objective. And that's going to be a challenge for our country as it is for the world. We know the high price that's been paid already by the United States, but also by the alliance. We know as well that if we can create conditions in Afghanistan over time that uh, bring about some stability, some real enduring stability, that that sanctuary or that safe haven uh, will be uh, interrupted or at least compromised, and we hope eliminated as a threat. The United States has plans, and we're going to hear more detail from the President, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, 17,000 more troops are committed. We don't know if that's the final number. It hasn't been formally um, ratified yet. But we know that the President is going to be talking about this in the next couple of days. But beyond the contribution of troops, we obviously need more than just boots on the ground. We do need a common strategy, and we also need a common uh, agreement on an exit strategy. And that, of course, will be very important to this, uh, the reason why we're here today, which is the transatlantic uh, relationship. Let me just mention a couple of things about Iran another challenge for the region and for the world. We know now that Iran possesses uh, some degree, depending on how you analyze it, of nuclear capability, low enriched uranium. We know also that they've made progress on their uh, missile systems, the delivery mechanism, so to speak. We also need a consensus on this, this issue as well, and that's not presently uh, before us. We need to work on that consensus. It's going to require a lot more work than we've been doing in the last couple of years. We have to combine, I believe, as we have in the past, but we still have to keep this on the table, both sanctions and incentives if we're going to get this right. And just as is true in Afghanistan, we have to get this right. The margin for error here on what we do with regard to Iran and Afghanistan is very small. Uh, if not uh, at, at a, a zero number. We cannot fail and we cannot make a mistake. And we know that this transatlantic relationship uh, has been tested over many years. In the last century, tested in the, the crucible of world wars, tested by the seismic and really transformational change that uh, has taken place with regard to our economy in the United States, the economy of Europe, and really the economy of the world. It has been tested. It's been tested by uh, terrorism and division and disease and go down the list, and more recently tested by the challenge uh, of climate change. But we also know that even as that relationship has been tested year after year and decade after decade, it has endured and it has been a bright light. Our job, those of us who play any role at all, whether it's as a citizen as an elected official, as a diplomat, uh, or as an advocate. We have an obligation to make sure that that relationship is enduring and is very strong. I have great confidence, not only in our ability to do that together, but I have, I have an awful lot of confidence uh, in this new administration. President Obama is someone I know pretty well. I've worked with him and campaigned hard for him. I know his character, uh, I know his heart, uh, and I know his uh, commitment uh, to getting these uh, challenges uh, lined up the right way so we can work together on them. I also know that he's someone who takes very seriously the obligation that has been given to him, the obligation to serve the United States of America at, at a terribly difficult time in our nation's history. So I have a lot of confidence in him, and when you talk about foreign policy, I have a lot of confidence in the team he's got around him. Just two, I'll mention, two former colleagues from the Senate, Vice President Biden and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, two very strong figures, who have a br both, both of whom have uh, broad experience in foreign affairs. It's a good team, and there are many others we can mention, the envoys and the other diplomats who are going to help. They are committed, as all of us are, to making sure that this 
transatlantic relationship is uh, strong and enduring. So let it be said of us many years from now that in our time, when we had the obligation but also the power to do something positive to foster stronger relationships and make sure this relationship is ever uh, strong, may it be said of us that we did all we could uh, to keep that bright light uh, burning ever, ever brightly. And with that, I wanted to introduce my colleague, and just to, to uh, make sure that everyone knew who else was in the room with us, I just wanted to mention our other colleagues who are with us today. Senator Voinovich of Ohio is with us. Senator Risch of Idaho is with us. Senator Martinez of Florida. Senator Shaheen of New Hampshire. And we have several members of the United States House of Representatives, Congressman Issa, Congressman Mike Turner, Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher, Congressman Ron Kind, and finally, Congressman uh, Alcees Hastings. We wanted to make sure that uh, you knew the kind of commitment that this delegation has uh, to this very important responsibility that we all share to keep this relationship strong. And with that, I want to introduce my colleague, Bob Bennett, who has served in the United States Senate since, I believe, 1992, or at least elected in 92. And he's been a great uh, uh, voice in the Senate for bipartisanship, but also a great voice for those newer members coming in the door to help us learn more and more every day about the Senate. I'm honored to serve with Senator Bob Bennett. When I got to the Senate in 1993, Bob Dole took a group of us up to New Jersey to sit down and spend the day with Richard Nixon. Uh, a fascinating experience because he no longer had his ego on the table. He could simply demonstrate his intellect, and he gave us a fascinating and very illuminating tour around the world. But among the other things he said to us was, you cannot do your job as a senator if you don't travel. Yeah, there's no, no substitute for being on the ground and meeting people on their own home territory to get an understanding of what's going on. Then he said, speaking accurately and prophetically, the press will attack you for spending your time traveling, but it makes great speech material when you get home. And I have found that that is true. And I have tried to follow that advice and travel. And in the process of traveling, you begin to understand which groups are worth going to and which groups you can be too busy to go back to. <laughs> and I simply want to uh, pay tribute to the German Marshall Fund and all of the sponsors whose name you, names you see here for putting together something that I'm happy to come back to. I was here at the first one where they had John McCain as the keynote speaker to open and John Edwards as the speaker to end. They got it half right in terms of picking the nominees. <laughs> I'm sure that John McCain would rather be here in another capacity but the fact that he continues to come back demonstrates that he too recognizes, as do I, very much the value of the Brussels Forum. And I want to say thank you for all you do, thank you for the job you have done, and thank you to all of you who help educate us and make us want to continue to come back. I have an apology to make. I, John, I'm so sorry. I, I, I feel terrible. <laughs> no, my, I have some notes here, and when I got to Afghanistan, John McCain just wrote a very important uh, op-ed in the Washington Post about Afghanistan. It was my intention to include him in that part of my remarks. I went through it, didn't mention the op-ed, and then didn't have him on my list. John, I'm so sorry about that. And I'm... Uh, let me just say, and I know I'm taking more time than I should, but um, w one of the reasons why uh, I think a lot of the American people are not sure yet about where we're going in Afghanistan is because we haven't had enough of a debate about it. We've spent a lot of time, appropriately so, on Iraq the last couple of years. We haven't spent nearly enough time in America. I won't speak for other 
parts of the world in a full and vigorous debate uh, in terms of what we do in Afghanistan. John McCain, uh, not just in that uh, opinion piece he did this past week in the Washington Post, but in other times as well, has been very thoughtful about this. And one of the ways we're going to get it right is by making sure that voices uh, of experience like John's, not only on the military challenge, but also on diplomacy and the other challenges we have with regard to Afghanistan, not to mention uh, Iran and, and other places, uh, we have to make sure that we listen to those voices. And John, we uh, greatly respect uh, the work you've done uh, to make sure that we're focused in an appropriate way on the challenge in Afghanistan. And I can't tell you how sorry I am about <laughs> not mentioning your name here. And I'm grateful. Thank you. some things around a little bit before uh, the President of the European Commission joins us for a conversation. Um, tonight, there's night owl sessions after the main event. If you come in here, it's going to be energy security. Should be pretty good. We're going to try a little bit of a new format. Um, out in the bar area, we're going to be doing uh, EU-Israel relations. Um, one of those uh, topics that always uh, generates a lot of interest and commentary here. And um, then we'll, hold on one second. Uh, and, uh, and after this, obviously, we'll get on to dinner. I just want to say before I introduce the person who's going to really introduce the session, how grateful we are to have you tonight. President Barroso, we know how exhausted you must be after uh, taking care of the, your ministers for the entire day um, of, of various kinds, and uh, it's uh, really wonderful to have you here. It's my pleasure now to turn uh, the podium over to Martin Yeager of Daimler. Thank you, Craig. Honorable members of Congress and Parliament, Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have the, the great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight to you the Honorable Jose Manuel Barroso, President of the European Commission. He has kindly agreed to be our discussant at this conversation tonight, and uh, the moderation, moderator of this session will be Ulysse Gosset from the French television. President Barroso is well known to all of us as a true European with global mind and education, and he's speaking many languages. Uh, among them, I uh, may proudly add, uh, the German language. Uh, this is an excellent thing, and uh, unfortunately, rarely found here in Brussels. His, <laughs> his academic, we try to speak English, and we, we, we meddle us through. The, his academic career includes master degrees in law, European studies, and political science, from the universities in, uh, of Lisbon and Geneva, and further studies at Georgetown University, the International University Institute in Luxembourg, and the European University Institute in Florence. Six times, José Manuel Barroso was elected to the Portuguese Parliament. He held various ministerial functions and was eventually Prime Minister of Portugal before his nomination as President of the European Commission in 2004. There would be much to say about the various political initiatives President Barroso has taken during his European mandate, but let me emphasize only one, his tireless effort to keep the European Union together in mastering this economical and financial crisis. Even if much of the measures are and need to be taken, at national level. Jose Manuel Barroso provides leadership and lives up to his responsibility as President of the European Commission to be the guardian of the treaty and the mediator between sometimes, I have to admit, conflicting national interests. Like many of his countrymen in history, he is a courageous sailor and navigator and uh, he will not rest before having sailed the ship out of the storm into safe waters. Herzlich willkommen, President Barroso. The floor is yours. You, 
Merci. Uh, bonsoir à tous. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, the President of the European Commission for being here tonight after uh, such a crucial and important meeting with the uh, 27 head of states. And uh, a crucial meeting because it is the last one before the G20 in London. Mm -hmm. And the real question for everybody here and uh, around Europe is to know uh, if the Europeans are now all together with one basic uh, line before the summit. Are you ready for the G20 in London? And what will be your message? What is the plan? Yes. First of all, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your nice words of introduction. Yes, I think it was a great success, the summit uh, today and yesterday. We achieved among the 27 member states of the European Union a coordinated approach as a contribution to what we hope will be also a coordinated approach in the G20 in London. You remember that this process, the G20, started in fact by European initiative. It was during the um, French presidency that uh, President Sarkozy and myself, we went to Camp David to propose to President Bush the organization of the first G20 summit um, in Washington. And now we have the second one on the 2nd of April in London. And uh, we achieved the coordination of our positions among the 27. Uh, you know, the G20 will be shared by Gordon Brown in, um, in London. There was first a meeting some time ago shared by Angela Merkel in Berlin. And I'm very proud to say that we have a common position, but we want this common position to be a contribution to which will be hopefully a common position of the, the G20 because it's a global crisis that needs indeed a global response. So what will be the message of Europe? Our message is that we have to act in several areas at the same time. We should avoid this issue of a choice between regulation or stimulation. We need both. We need a, a stimulus to a global demand, but we need also to improve the regulation and the supervision of the financial markets because there is a real problem of confidence there. I particularly believe that it's critically important that we address the issue of impaired assets in the United States as well and in Europe. But apart from that, it's important to reject all forms of protectionism, that we commit ourselves to conclude Doha trade talks, and at least to have a standstill and to avoid any kind of uh, um, protectionist measures, and we, that we don't forget the developing countries of the world, that we keep our commitments regarding the Millennium Development Goals. So these are the four areas where I believe we have to act. The economy, through the recovery plan, financial regulation supervision, the trade and uh, the support to developing countries. But as you know, there are a lot of people uh, who are asking Europe to do more uh, to solve the crisis, to spend more on the stimulus packages. So, uh, and in fact, during this summit, the European rejected uh, a, a new uh, engagement of Europe in terms of financial means to solve the crisis. So why did the Europeans reject the appeal from the Americans to do more? Do you think Europe doesn't do more or what do you reply to them? Europe is doing a lot. It's a huge effort. We have never done so much in a coordinated manner as we are doing now. We, our estimate is that we are doing, if we consider not only the discretionary fiscal stimulus but also what is the role of the automatic stabilizers, we are around 4% of GDP. Huh? And the uh, European Central Bank president just informed us now that if we consider the guarantees we are giving to the financial sector, is 23%, I repeat, 23% of the GDP of Europe is now, I mean, in some way engaged in this effort. So it's a lot. You but is it enough? Let's see. Now what we have to do is to implement the plans. I said to my colleagues in the European Council, implementation, not gesticulation. We just approved the plan. In December, we approved the plan. Of course, that takes some time because there is afterwards the legislative decision that has to be taken in each of our member states. Only now we are starting the first, to see the first results of the plan. But what we decided, in fact, it was already decided also by the finance ministers at the G20 meeting, is that we will do everything that is necessary. But it is, I think, unwise. It is not prudent before we implement the plan, we have to start speaking about new possible additional mm -hmm. plans. So let's keep the situation in the review, but there was a clear determination to, to go ahead with this plan. And I, honestly, I don't see, uh, I, sometimes I see in the press, but I don't agree with the analysis that there is a basic difference <coughs> between the Americans uh, doing more and we doing less. It's different. The systems are different in the United States and Europe. Because of our welfare systems in Europe, 
uh, we, in fact, because the automatic stabilizers have a much greater role, I mean, because of unemployment sub sub subsidies, for instance, are much higher in Europe than the United States. So we cannot always compare only the fiscal discretionary stimulus. And, and if you really compare, you, you, you would say that Europe has spent about, about $400 billion for yes. the stimulus package, euros, which is euros. Uh, euros. the difference? 400 billion <laughs> euros. <laughs> and, and, and almost as, as much as the US, you would say? Look, we cannot compare in terms of just quantitative uh, elements because of the dimension of the economies and also because of the automatic stabilizers. I mean, just to give an example, uh, a worker in GM in Detroit and a worker in Saab in Sweden or here in Belgium. Here in Belgium, if someone goes unemployed, he gets 60% uh, of his salary and afterwards 50% of his salary. And in most of our countries, there is always some minimum contribution. In the United States, after six months, you get zero, zero dollars. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the role of the automatic stabilizers in Europe, it's much bigger. So we cannot anticipate. It depends on duration of the, of the, um, of the, 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 the recession. But in, in, we have countries in Europe, like the Scandinavian countries, where the weight of the state is almost 60% at least more than 50%. We cannot ask those countries to go much higher. So mm -hmm. the situation is very different. What is important is that we are going the same way, uh, hopefully not only in that matter, but also in others, namely committing ourselves to avoid any kind of uh, protectionism. I think this is very important. The United mm -hmm. States and Europe work together to conclude the Doha trade talks and also, by the way, agreeing on some basic principles for financial, I mean, sensible financial regulation and supervision. You would say that protectionism is the main danger today for the world? It is one of the main dangers, really. I see um, many worrying signals of economic nationalism and, uh, uh, and protectionism. And now we have figures because one of the worst problems now is that for the first time we have this recession, a sharp drop in demand, but also a contraction of global trade, a real, not, not a slowdown, a contraction of global trade in volumes, at the same time that we have a crisis in financial system. What it means, means that there is also lack of finance for trade. Mm -hmm. Uh, some countries, Brazil, has less 50% of finance for trade than it had mm -hmm. before. By the way, one of the initiatives we approved today, and there's, uh, there's been a lot of, of preparation also with our American friends, is a program for finance for trade. We are working with, uh, uh, with IMF. Uh, just this, this afternoon we spoke uh, with the president of uh, uh, World Bank, Bob Zolik, uh, here already after the summit. And we are working with our American friends and with the international financial institutions to have some specific initiatives for finance for trade. And by the way, Gordon Brown has been very active in uh, putting forward also some very interesting ideas in that matter. When do you see the end of the storm? Some people like Jean-Claude Trichet, the um, European bank, uh, president said he might see some light at, in 2010, do you, and others have seen some light too at that time. Do you agree? Do you think 2010 is a good time to say, well, we're going to get over and, and, and think about the future and not of the storm? I hope so, <laughs> but I don't want to commit myself to a precise date. You know, the forecasts have been reviewed all the time in a negative trend. Let's concentrate now on implementation and let's leave the, let's say, the, the predictions for... We are in the eye of the storm at the moment? We are in a very difficult situation and the, the situation is not yet over. So we have seen some improvements, namely in the financial sector already. Here in Europe, the evolution mm -hmm. of, for instance, the spreads, the, it's, it's been positive. Uh, the situation is better now, but in fact, for instance, in terms of unemployment, we expect unemployment to go up, to go up. And this is one of my, it maybe my first concern now is the rise of unemployment in Europe and what it will bring also in terms of uh, uh, social uh, concerns. Jean-Claude Trichet would be too optimistic? Look, I'm not going to speak about optimistic or... You know, the founder, one of the founders of one of the père fondateur of our European Union, the European community, Jean Monnet, said, I'm neither optimistic or pessimistic, I'm determined. So I think we should avoid this issue of being optimistic. What we have is to do the right things, with determination. I think we are doing the right okay. things and we have to be ready, if necessary, to do more. Some other than Americans are saying that Europe is not doing enough. It's the European unions and they are going to demonstrate in May uh, all over Europe. Uh, what do you tell them when they say Europe should do more to help 
um, uh, the unemployed, the people who have no jobs, and do you agree with their complaints? Look, I really think that uh, there, it's an artificial debate. What I see between Europe and the United States, we are, we are getting closer, much closer in many areas, mm -hmm. including uh, some agreements on some, let's say, sensible principles for regulation mm -hmm. and, uh, and supervision. The need to have some uh, fiscal stimulus to the economy. So I, I really, the trend is to work together, and I, I don't think that debate should be concentrated more on this, on that. It's helpful. Indeed, I hope. And this is not just wishful thinking. From the information I have, I, I think we are going to have a very, uh, let's say, uh, convergent position in London. And it's not only us and mm -hmm. the Americans, it's also the, the Chinese, the Russians, the, 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 the Brazilians, the, I mean the Indians, and many others. And this is one of the interesting things about the G20, is that Europe and the United States have to be together. It's, uh, without American, Europe leadership will not solve this issue. Almost 80% of the wholesale financial market is American or European. Mm -hmm. So we have to be leading this, but of course engaging also others. Before his election, you wrote to uh, the future president of the United States and to Mr. Obama. Now you are uh, appealing for a new transatlantic relation. What would you say to uh, the president of the United States when you meet him, uh, when you see him in Prague and in London? What will be your message to him? What will you tell him? Uh, in, in fact, I already spoke uh, with President Obama by the phone, and uh, he himself said that he wanted to work with us, with the Commission and with Europe, on two main issues, energy security, climate change apart from the other, of course, uh, matters. But uh, with the Commission, this is our part of our core business here in Europe. So these, I think, are two concrete aspects where I hope that in Prague, when we will meet uh, bilaterally, but also with all the heads of state and government of Europe, we will address this issue. But of course, even before that, in um, London, in the G20, uh, there will be, um, hopefully, a great deal of convergence and common work on the financial and economic crisis. And between the two, there will be, of course, the very important NATO summit. Some have spoken about a, a, a US-Europe honeymoon, honeymoon after the election of uh, President Obama. Do you agree? And do you see it going for a long time? Or there are signs of disagreement? What do you see? No, I think it will be hopefully more than a honeymoon, but a stable, permanent, happy marriage. <laughs> Not just a passion, but a real. I'm a true believer in a transatlantic relationship, really. I think I've, I've been before President Obama and I will be with <laughs> President Obama. I really believe it's critically important. Basically, we share the same values. We, we are for open societies, open economies. But as open societies need the rule of law, open economies also need some rules and principles. And I think there is now a great deal of convergence around some principles. Uh, about what can be open economies with the principles of transparency, accountability, and we can work a lot. I mean, one thing I'm sure, without strong European Union, American cooperation, the world will not be a better one. With our cooperation, it can be a better one, but not an exclusive relation. We have to engage others as well. But basically, we share the same values, and I think it is our enlightened self-interest to work together closer. Uh, we have some good things also done in the past. For instance, during the German presidency and the leadership of Angela Merkel, we have launched, Angela, myself, and President Bush, the Transatlantic Economic Council. This is very important from a, a concrete point of view in terms of achieving a greater degree of regulatory convergence. This is a good work in progress. And so we have, I mean, just to give you some figures, the United States since 2000, more than half of its investment abroad is in Europe. 14 million people on both sides of the Atlantic are living directly from jobs created for this transatlantic relationship. So it's not just talk, or it's about concrete interests that we have to develop uh, and to deepen this relationship. Okay. I would like to turn to the audience and see if there are any questions for you. But first, uh, could you tell us, uh, do you have the feeling that now in the world there is a big bargain going on between Europe, Asia, and the United States? Do you see the big bargain, and what is at stake? If we succeed or not, how do you see it? Do you see it as a great bargain in the world now? Uh, certainly there is a, a rearrangement of the, the global forces, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a, a real important fact is the emergence of Asia and powers like China. This is certainly the case. By the way, I think Europe can play there a very important role because we, uh, in Europe, there is something where we have some experience 
after the World War II, we have created the European Community. And so we have an experience of supranational institutions. The Commission is a supranational institution. Supranational and transnational work, convergence, setting standards. I mean, 27 countries we have now, I mean, to now almost 500 million people. So we can be a very credible partner of our American uh, friends, but also globally. Not, as I say very often, not to impose, but to propose some of rules that are important for the 21st century on issues like uh, trade and finance, but also on energy security, on fight against climate change, some of those global issues that need this kind of uh, supranational cooperation. But not, uh, is Europe a superpower today, would you say, or not? Uh, it is. Uh, I mean, we are not classic superpower in terms of geopolitical and defense matters, but Europe is the biggest trade partner in the world. The aggregate uh, economic product is the biggest. It's even bigger than the United States if you consider 27 countries. It's by far the biggest donor of development assistance, 60%. So it is indeed a superpower from an economic point of view. Politically, we could and should do more, honestly. But okay. I think today it's already a very important and relevant power. Thank you very much. Uh, I see two questions. One here, please. Could you introduce yourself and... Right here? No? Here, please. Erika Mann from the European Parliament. Oh, yes. uh, Commissioner Barroso. I have one question. Uh, we are going, um, and you obviously will, be, will return as Commissioner President. Um, can you imagine that we could agree on signing an agreement between the United States and uh, in Europe on uh, free trade? Um, obviously, we're considering um, something similar with Canada. We already have a free trade agreement uh, with Mexico. So uh, would this be something you would pursue, or would you continue to have the, the doubts from you, uh, your past um, uh, colleagues? I, I'm in favor of a global trade deal, of the Doha trade talk. And in fact, we very much hope that uh, our American friends will take some decisions on that as soon as possible because we were very close to a global deal at the end of last year in the modalities uh, uh, in Geneva, very, very close. Uh, so I hope that the new American administration now takes a decision on it as soon as possible because it's critically important. Having said this, yes, of course, the, the goal should be to have a transatlantic integrated uh, space, uh, and we are working for that. What I mentioned before, this transatlantic economic council is a contribution to it. But honestly, I think we should not uh, have alternative to a global uh, trade uh, deal because of the reasons I, I mentioned before. Please. Good evening. My name is Petra Steenen. I'm from the Netherlands. And I wonder how you as a leader, European leader, can benefit from the experience Obama showed us how social media can entice young people to actually participate as citizens in elections. And I think in my country, if young people had been able to vote for the American elections, they would have gone 80%. I fear that on the 4th of June, the outcome, the, out, the turnout will be a bit lower. So my question for you is, how would you describe, um, how would you use Twitter or a text message, 160 <coughs> letters, to actually entice people to come and vote for the European elections? Oh, I think a lot of leaders in Europe are studying carefully the experience of the American elections and some of the innovations brought by the Obama, not only the Obama campaign, but um, it was a great, a great show of democracy. And I think the, I mean, the respect all over the world for the United States was growing during this campaign. For, and so I, I think there is a lot of, uh, of inspiration to be drawn. So but you are right. The, for the European Parliament, the, it is there some sources of inspiration, certainly. But are you worried that there will be uh, a lot of people not voting for the next election? I am. I am worried, yes, of course. But, you know, traditionally for the European Parliament, elections are not, um, are not the great. There is not a great level of participation. In Europe, the patterns are different as well. It depends. But there is not a very high level of participation. We will very much, and we as Commission, are informing uh, the citizens about what is at stake and we are doing. But the decisions have to be made on that matter at national level because, in fact, we see from past experience that the European election 
as always uh, uh, also a very national content in each of our member okay. states. Just be, before going to the floor again, uh, one question you didn't answer about the uh, European unions, les syndicats. Uh, some people are calling not for only a new deal in Europe, but a new social deal. What do you say? I'm in favor of more commitment in the social area, uh, but and that's why, for instance, we have put forward this idea of an employment summit that we'll organize in, uh, in May. I have received the social partners, not only the trade unions, the trade unions confederation, but Business mm -hmm. Europe, it's the main uh, employers association here. And uh, just yesterday, together with the presidency, the current presidency of mm -hmm. the council, plus the two new presidencies, the Sweden, Swedish and the Spanish, so the Prime Minister of Sweden, Prime Minister Heinfeld and Prime Minister Zapatero and of course Prime Minister Polanek, we met the social partners and we very much want to agree with them on some uh, common, common action. I think it's the time for the social partners also to unite and to have a common response with the national governments and European institutions to face this crisis. Thank you. Please. As a company and as a person involved since many years in transatlantic dialogues, <clears throat> the discussion and, and the, the cooperation at executive level between the European Union, <clears throat> the member states and the United States is improving over the years. Uh, there are also many contacts between the European Parliament and US Congress, but the type of work is differently. Uh, the contacts between the legislative powers remains more of a diplomatic exchange. We have not yet reached the stage where they would really cooperate on specific issues, what you do at executive level. Don't you think it would be useful if also you and, and all the political forces would see that we get also the congressional and the parliamentary side together to work on future projects so that in the end we come out with common or at least compatible positions? Yes, uh, I agree with you. I think more has to be done. By the way, there are very good initiatives going on also on the European Parliament. In the European Parliament there are some uh, members that are very active on transatlantic relations across the different parties. I see some of them here. And uh, uh, it's true that um, they are different, different parliaments. Uh, the, but anyway, I think more should be done. At executive level, I want to underline uh, this <coughs> initiative that was in fact taken by Angela Merkel and myself, together with President Bush, of setting this uh, transatlantic economic council. It's very concrete, and it is, and it is in the uh, with the previous administration it was at the White House level. In the European Union, it's the Commission. It's in fact Vice President Verheugen from the Commission that is responsible for it, and where we meet and try to achieve some concrete. Uh, results on some specific areas. I hope that we'll go on with this experience. So, yes, we have to have more contacts at executive level, but also uh, um, putting together in more effective manners our two legislatures. Please. So, uh, Robin Niblett from Chatham House. Uh, I wanted to turn to your first comment about the different approaches to stimulating the economy between Europe and the United States. Um, it, it strikes me that President Obama is trying to use this crisis with his stimulus package to shake the United States out, to transform it, uh, to use this crisis as an opportunity uh, to put America on a different path uh, to growth, infrastructure, investment, energy, etc. Europe, however, if you take those automatic stabilizers, this is spending to sit out the crisis, to wait it out in a way to make sure the crisis doesn't get worse. And I'm worried that there's a very different uh, style, a different culture perhaps, uh, in those two different approaches. And my question really is to do with protectionism. Is there a risk that the European approach to this, you call it a stimulus package, but in essence this, this uh, stabilizing approach might actually feed uh, some of the protectionist sentiment in the United States? People are waiting for America to get strong again so they can export to America. And Europe sits waiting no. for that eventuality to happen. No, I, I don't agree with that. Look, just today we took very important decisions. Maybe you are not yet aware of them. For instance, we have decided to double a facility we have of balance of payment support to countries that are not in the euro area from 25 billion euros to 50 billion euros. This is concrete spending. We are already using that money now for Hungary and from Latvia. We just received a request from Romania and we'll probably have to do more in the future. So it was my proposal to double from 25 to 50 billion euros. We have decided to give a contribution of 75 billion euros 
for the IMF for uh, kind of uh, emergency situations. We have adopted a, a specific program of trans-European networks, namely in the field of uh, energy interconnection, of 5 billion euros. Uh, namely, it is energy interconnection in electricity and um, gas and also for broadband internet. And that was my proposal made in December of using unspent money from the community budget instead of going back to the national treasuries to be spent in European-wide projects. So we are doing a lot. You mentioned uh, President Obama's uh, ideas of infrastructure. Great, but let me tell you very frankly, I've been, you know, Europe is more developing than infrastructure than the United States. I mean, I most, most, uh, I mean high-speed trains, we are much, much more developed. I, I say that I have been living for some time in the United States, so there are some areas where we don't need to do exactly the same kind of thing. There are others where the Americans are much more advanced than us and uh, should learn with innovation, some top-class universities, uh, research. Uh, and there, but there are other matters where we are, in fact, uh, our, for instance, our top-class trains are much more advanced than the Americans. So if the Americans now do more in infrastructure, great. I think it's a good, but why should we? I mean, we cannot spend money for the sp sake of spending. We have also to look at the long-term sustainability of our public finances. So let's... I mean, Let's, let's keep this in mind. And we have received a very complete report of our European Central Bank president. So I think, basically speaking, we are on the same line. But of course, in Europe, we have 27 countries. We cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach. The situation of Germany is different from the situation of, of uh, let's say, some of the for instance, countries that are under balance of payment support. This is the complexity that we have to understand. And really, I will not underestimate I think we should not, uh, should not uh, let's say, magnify the differences because what I see broadly is more convergence between the approach between Americans and, and Europeans. You mentioned the IMF. Some people are calling for a, a new IMF, a new role for IMF, and some people would like to see emerging a new uh, world central bank. Do you agree with that? Proposal, or are you a little bit cautious? When we you are. Say? We are for the reinforcement of the international financial institutions, including the IMF. Yes, but it is world central. I'm. I'm. I'm against too many centralized uh, centralization. Really, I mean, we have to be pretty. Much, the idea of reinforcing the international financial institutions. Yes, we fully, we very much support. And in fact, this is part of the proposal that we have agreed today. Okay, let's take two questions in a row because we're going to the end. Please. Gerd Weiskirchen, member of uh, German Parliament, Mr. President, uh, talking about convergences. Uh, before the financial crisis, we have had kind of a common sense and common agreement that a new green deal should be one of the convergences. Mm. Uh, are you now thinking about that we should renew this? Yes. That is indeed a very good illustration of what I just suggested. I see much more convergence now. If you look at the Obama plan, and if you look at our economic recovery plan, when we speak about smart green growth, it is very much the same doctrine, I would say. What are we suggesting our member states, and in fact some of the facilities we have created at European level, is don't, don't make investments in the short term that are contradictory to medium and long term sustainability and interests. So we have to find the smart investment now. Part of it is the investment to support the greening of our economy. That's why we have launched, it's part, I will not now like to go in detail because with this Brussels jargon, but that is part of our Green Cars Initiative, what the European Investment Bank is doing for supporting the transition for our automobile industry to a more, let's say, green industry, or at least friendly, more friendly to the environment, and some concrete proposals, those in the energy interconnection that I mentioned earlier. So yes, this is indeed uh, one of the areas where I see uh, closer uh, Americans and Europeans, namely the importance of fighting climate change. And so far, the, the comments made by President Obama were, I believe, in the right direction. And really, we need Americans and Europeans to go together that if we can have, if we want to have Chinese and others on board. Two more questions. Madam. Barbara Thomas, Judge, Chairman of the UK Atomic Energy Authority. And it's really about what you were just saying. You said in the beginning of your, of your comments that energy and climate change were something that Europe could work with America on. And you just talked a bit about climate change, and we know that there are ways that we can deal with, with cap-and-trade systems and with dealing with carbon. But what about energy in general? 
how would you see the, U the EU and the U.S. working together on a, a common energy policy? Because I wonder if actually there's a common energy policy within the EU itself. And if there is, could you discuss it a little bit? And could you discuss how you would engage the U.S. to have a common policy? Yes, uh, we have been developing it. In fact, some from three or four years ago. I'm very happy to say that we have launched this U European energy policy. And today we have taken important decisions on that matter. Uh, but of course, once again, we are 27 member states. You cannot expect us to have a unified, like the United States, position. But we have agreed on very important principles, namely on the internal market for energy, and we will see their progress. One of the topics in the agenda for the meeting, the first meeting of President Obama with us in, in Prague, the 5th of April, will be precisely energy and climate change. Okay. That's uh, where I see a great, great possibilities of concrete uh, progress. I see two more questions here, the two last ones together, please, sir, and then, yeah. My name is Monji from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Japan has been trying to strengthen ties with Europe since early, especially in the 90s, and we have done a lot, but the progress is not yet quite satisfactory. The reason is that compared to very strong transatlantic relations and very strong Japanese alliance, Japan-Europe relation is very weak, but we share the same value, and now the challenges we face are global, so there should be a lot of scope for cooperation uh, between among Japan, U.S., and Europe. How do you see the prospect of further furthering Japan-EU relations? I support and, that. And let's hear the last question here oh. before you answer, please. Um, uh, me? Yes. Uh, my name is Matja Sorsi. I, I come from Hungary and partly the Council of Europe. When my country exceeded the European Union, we were told we join a community of values. And I, I, just, I just remind us because the economical crisis have non-economical consequences as well. The growing radicalism in the political life in many of our countries, uh, again, xenophobia against minority groups, and also lots of a growing number of human rights violations on the labor market. More people who belong to different minorities are easily, more easily losing their job. So my question is whether the Commission is going to address this issue. It's not economical, but very political based on values. Yes. Regarding Japan, I agree that we have to do more. Uh, as you are right, we share the same values and we have to do more. I mean, at political level, the relations are good. Uh, there are you no know, problems, but it's, it's true that we need to have more dynamism. I've received here the, the Japanese Prime Minister. I went to Japan. We have the regular summits. But honestly, also, there have been some, let's say, political crisis in Japan that sometimes I felt that there was not enough focus. Uh, on our side as well, uh, I think, you know, to be very open with you, I think we have taken for granted this relationship. And I think that's not good. Precisely because there were no problems, we have taken that, uh, that relation for granted. And it's like with persons. Sometimes we forget to say those we love that we love them. <laughs> I mean, we have to keep and nurture that relation more. And uh, I think we are, and thank you for your remark, because I think it is important for both of us to understand because how close we are on the basic issues. The second issue about human rights, and look, in Europe we have the most advanced system of the world in terms of respect for human rights. I mean, no one, I mean, the most advanced system, huh? uh, I mean, in terms, on national level and at um, uh, European level, we have a European Court of Justice, we have a European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, uh, so there are always possibilities. Of course there are violations of human rights all over, but to be frank with you, I have much more concern with what's going on in some other parts of the world where, for instance, journalists are systematically uh, killed and we never know who has done it, activists on human rights. So, I mean, having said this, of course, we have to address all concerns and we have the right mechanisms. If there is any complaint that we receive about the violation of human rights, we will convey that complaint to the appropriate uh, uh, authorities, not the commission. The commission, we are an executive. That's not, it's the tribunals. At national level or at European level, we have the jurisdictional, uh, let's say, instances and, um, and bodies to, to analyze all these kind of things. And the Commission, uh, we have in our policy, it's very clear, we have a very active instruments to promote the culture of human rights, to, pro to, to, to have some support, but once again, it's up to the tribunals, to the courts, to uh, enforce 
the, uh, the, the law uh, when it comes to the respect for, for human rights. Thank you. I would like to end this session and this conversation with you by a, a more personal question, uh, a question probably that everybody has in his mind about yourself and your future. You know that you have been president of the, UN, uh, the uh, European Commission since 2004, mm. and in June uh, there might be a decision uh, very important for you. What is your personal desire? You, you have been supported by Angela Merkel, by Gordon Brown, who said you did an excellent job. We don't know yet about Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, what is your uh, <laughs> ambition? Do you like to stay look, uh, at look, the job? Or do look, you like to stay? Do you like Brussels? Look, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Europe. I love Europe. That's why I, I was prime minister in my country and I accepted this uh, challenge of being president of the commission. And I, I'm very, very, let's say, motivated by this job. It's a very important position. Uh, I think it was Chris Patton who said probably the most difficult job in the world <laughs> because it's not easy to have uh, 27. This is the first time we have this enlarged Europe. It's not, no longer. That's the message I want to convey to our American friends. This is no longer the European Union of the 6 or of the 12. It's the European Union of the 27. This is a reunified Europe. It's great. I mean, to have together from Poland to Portugal, from the Baltic countries to Greece, from, from Scandinavia uh, to uh, Romania. It's amazing what's going on. So I'm, I really enjoy what I'm doing, but that decision has to be taken after the European elections. It's true that I have a broad support from the different political families. Uh, I received the support not only from my political families, DPP, but also center-right, mm -hmm. but uh, also from leaders like Gordon Brown, Zapatero, uh, and many others from the socialist family and liberal mm -hmm. family. And I'm very proud. I see this as a recognition of the work that the Commission has been doing for Europe. So the, the, the word is five more years for Mr. Uh, José Manuel the, Barroso? The, the word is let's now focus on fighting against this economic and financial crisis. Let's now focus on the priorities and we'll deal with these political issues after the European elections. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.